Hey everyone, let's try some integration tests today. I have the simplified testing pyramid in front of me, and obviously there are many more types of tests. There are load testing, performance testing, etc., security testing. But you can see there's three main types for functional testing. Integration tests, they're somewhere in the middle. Uh, if you see on the right, we see that unit tests are probably the fastest to execute, to write as well, so low effort, they're isolated. On the other hand, end-to-end -end tests are slower to execute, slower to write, but they test the system as a whole. And some in the middle, like integration tests. There are various definitions of integration tests, but the main purpose for them is to verify that various components and subsystems work well together. So they communicate well, there are no inconsistencies, uh, they're compatible, and so forth. And I believe that having integration tests is really important. I, for example, said myself many times shipping buggy code to production just by running integration tests on the project where I had them. But Contrary to unit tests, which are easy to run, because you just run them as you run your code, integration tests usually need some environment or scaffolding. And I've seen different approaches to address this testing environment problem. One option would be to set up your environment using something like Docker Compose, run your tests, then shut down the environment. A similar approach would be GitHub service containers, where you can do very similar thing, but without Docker Compose. You can also use existing shared resources, let's say from your dev environment or staging environment. Maybe it's isolated database or namespace that you create and then shut down, but still requires some scaffolding, right? Another really great approach is to use in-memory or embedded services. For example, your database, has some in-memory representation and it's great you can run it with your go code for example run the tests against it shut it down but the problem is that not all databases and services and caches have their representation it's just in a memory package and another approach would be to use something like test containers and that's what we'll be focusing on in this video we'll write some integration tests obviously in go and see how test containers work with test containers you can create and manage dependencies and services as code. These dependencies should be able to run in a Docker container because the Docker runtime is still required for that to work. And there are many SDKs available in different languages to do that. And so, for example, if you look at the Go code, you can see that you can create a test container, provide the image, expose some ports, and then obviously after that you can run your tests and then shut down these containers. And this is great because, first of all, and the most importantly, you can just run go test command and it will scaffold your environment, run your tests, and then shut everything down. So quite simple. There is also a great level of flexibility, uh, so you can configure your dependencies how you want. There is also a great level of isolation. You don't need to jump to compose files and see what's there. Is my environment running or not? Maybe ports conflicting, etc. So everything is in this code that's responsible for integration tests. Awesome, so let's dive into that and write some integration tests. And for that, I have a very simple application that I call a URL shortener. It's very far from being a production ready app but still it talks to a database and cache. So as you can imagine, we give it a URL, it can play some key, saves it into the database. When we get URL by key, it first checks it in the cache and then goes to the database. But I think this is a very good use case to see how we can write some unit tests that use mocks, as well as integration tests with test containers. Also, if you look at the code trust, it's a simple API that has two handlers. One is create, one is get. In create, we obviously get a URL, make sure it's valid, generate some key using kind of this functionality. So from the available characters, then we save it into the database, right? And then in the get handler, we get the key, first check in the cache, if not, check it in the database. And I constructed it in a way that there is a new server constructor function where you can pass your dependencies. So in the case of main, function we pass mongodb and redis but as you can already imagine there are interfaces and mongo and redis implement these interfaces right um, i believe that's it so in the new server we also do init and yeah let's have a look at these two so if you look at our db.go file you can see that there is this db interface that means that we can implement different backends for that and for this use case we have the mongodb so there is an init function takes mongodb address makes connection saves this URL and gets this URL, right? So quite simple and absolutely the same thing we have in the cache. Also interface, similar functions, just a little bit different. Usually just in the cache, you call them set and get. And for Redis, there are implemented functions. So init, set and get, very simple. I also prepared this test utils file, not to waste too much time on this video, writing some boilerplate code, but there is, this important function, which is called test server. 
it's actually all our tests. And as you can see, we use assert package that's from the testify, and then we call our endpoints. So we pass testing object and also the HTTP test.server. So you can imagine we can you know write some unit tests for that, and as you will see, integration tests as well. So it only calls the URLs and asserts the requests. For example, invalid URL will result in bad request. Then we call create, pass some URL, that's all good. We save the key, right? So it's here. We try to get by invalid key, not found. And then when we get by real key, we should get the OK, right? And uh, validate that URL is what we sent previously. Great, so we have the testing code. Uh, we don't have the tests yet. So let's first figure out how to write some simple unit tests for that. So let's create the file. Maybe we'll call it unit test. Interesting thing about unit tests, you usually need mocks, especially when you have some dependencies like databases and services. And you can write them yourself, or you can use something like Mockery. So Mockery is this great tool that generates mock implementations for your interfaces. And that's quite handy because we save some time writing some boilerplate mocks. So let's do that, right? Let's go to installation and install this thing. Awesome, so we have Mockery. You can run Mockery dash dash all dash dash with expector. All right, it should create us some mocks, right? And it put them in the mocks directory, so you can configure that. All right, so if you can see, there is one for cache and one for DB. So if you open them, it's auto-generated code that kind of implements all our functions. So there will be get and set, right? And then you can also configure some expectors for that. So let's see how to use them in action. So because we are all in the in the main package, so we don't need anything else, but the function, let's maybe test server with mocks, right? So that's normal, right, test.t, right? And now we need to create the instances for our database and cache. So we can call the mock db equal, there will be mocks here, right? And then should we pass testing here, right? All right, and let's do the same for the cache. Mocks, there will be new cache here as well from t. All right, so we have our database and cache instances. Remember, we have this function new server, so we can call it now and then pass our mock db as well as mock cache. First of all, there is the first error that we see in our testing code. We usually should assert all errors because we don't expect it to happen here. So we can do assert, um, right now, error. Again, yeah, we use this testify package and then pass error. In Go, there is this great package called HTTP test that's really good to test uh, HTTP services. So let's use that, right? So call the HTTP test dot new server. Um, so I just noticed that we have two functions called the same name. One is in our main package and one is in HTTP test. So don't confuse the different functions. If you can see it, right? So what we pass there, we pass the handler HTTP handler. But what's interesting that our server returned here implements that because it has serve HTTP function as I believe. So we can just pass the server here. We should also not forget to close it. So server will close. At the end, actually call our testing code that we wrote, that I wrote previously. So we pass our HTTP test server as well as testing thing. Um, complaints here, right, so we also need to pass T here, and that would be it. So we use our mocks functions to create the database and cache. We pass them to our new server. So inside we call dot init, then we pass them to our new server function, and then create HTTP test and actually run the test inside this test server function. Now let's run and see if that would work. So we can simply run this go test. Let's always do uh, this minus v. I mean, we don't have any race here, but let's run it anyway. Great, and as you can see, it fails because this method was unexpected in it. What's happening that in this mocks package, you need there is this expector thing that you need to implement. You need to write down what calls do you expect and what they should return. For example, if you expect your mockdb to be called with, let's say, .init, then we need to write some expect for that, as well as for store URL, get URL functions. That's how you can tell unit tests what to return, in which case, some test data. So yeah, let's do that. 
So mock database, I think there will be right. So expect init. There are no parameters to init, and then return return an error. So we can do this and return new, right? So we don't expect any errors here, and then the same you can do for our cache because it also has init function, right? So that would be for init, but also in our test server we call create and get. So we also need to write the expects for those uh, calls. The amount of expects should generally match the amount of calls we make. All right, so I quickly implemented these expected calls to init to store URL on the database, get URL from the database, and the cache calls. So now we can actually go back and rerun our tests. And cool, it all works. We have our unit tests passing at the moment. Let's just make sure that they actually work. Maybe let's change something here to see if it fails. Cool, and it does, right? Because our code in this test server, so if you go there, you know, does this assert equal. So that's how you can mock your dependencies in the unit tests. Obviously, these are just mocks, right? It's some code that you wrote. We are not sure that actual calls to MongoDB or Redis, in our case, would succeed. So there is no testing for compatibility, for communication things. That's why you need integration tests. And I always start integration tests with this Go annotation. So Go build and put some tag name. Let's say integration. Why it's helpful? Because very often on the real projects, integration tests are slow. They can take minutes because they actually spin up databases, run some database calls, etc. So you want to have some separation and we can use these uh, go test tags. Cool, let's install test containers. Maybe let's go to the go example. Interesting, who is using test containers go? Actually, we use it at binarily uh, quite extensively, works great. Uh, but quick start maybe, right? So we need to go get it. Awesome. Now, similarly to what we had for our unit tests, we can run or we can write our test server. Yeah, we'll just call this test containers. And let's actually get some code from here. We obviously don't have mockdb and mock cache. That will be something from test containers. In test containers, you have thing called modules. So if your specific technology, database, or whatsoever is listed here, it's a little bit easier to run them. So we used Mongo. Right? So let's see. Yeah, Mongo is here. Uh, we need for Go, right? So we can do something like that. All right. So we need to go get MongoDB, and I believe let's do the same for Redis. And I would also use here the MongoDB community edition. Yeah, first of all, let's make sure that there is no error. We should terminate it once our tests are completed. So we can do MongoDB container, I believe it's called terminate. All right, obviously this needs to be replaced now. But let's start with the Redis first. I can just follow what we did for MongoDB container. Just call it Redis container here. And that would be Redis. And I believe it's no, still the prior. Um, we're going to use Alpine. Now, no error. And here, our Redis container. And because we didn't specify any ports here, so the random available port will be assigned. So we can get the endpoint now from our container. So uh, let's call it. This may be Mongo address, which is MongoDB container dot endpoint. We can do the same for our Redis. Now time to replace our MongoDB and all of that. So we can do Mongo database type and our Redis. So our types MongoDB and Redis expect some environment variables to be set. So if you go to MongoDB, it tries to connect to MongoDB on this Mongo other, and the same would be on, on the Redis. It will be Redis underscore ADDR. So let's set them in our integration tests. We can use set n, right? Mongo other will be, so the MongoDB part is not included in the endpoint, so we can do this plus our Mongo address, right? And the same, for Redis, um, I think in Redis it's also Redis. 
Awesome. So that's the basic integration tests. I think it's just 25 lines of code. We set up our MongoDB container. We don't specify any ports or configuration parameters, so as is, and we use the modules. So it comes from here. I'll show you later how to do it without modules. We do the same for Redis. We get the endpoints, we pass them as environment variables, which, the, which is then used here. So as you can see, there are no mocks here. This part is the same. We create still HTTP test, but a uh, new server now uses actual MongoDB and Redis. Awesome, so let's actually run the integration tests. And as I mentioned, test containers need a running Docker runtime. It could be by running Docker desktop locally. I use Colima myself, so I'll use Colima start. All right, so it's already running in my case. So now let's just execute the test, right? So the only difference from the pre previous run is that we added minus tags integration. So only when you provide this tag, this file and this test will be executed. Great, and we can see some positive results. So our tests are passing. And there is some quite colorful log from test containers. And yeah, we can see that these containers are being created, uh, like community, Redis. It also waits for them to be ready and accessible. So it's not like you spin up some containers and then they're not ready yet, and then you run the test and then they fail. Cool, so we used a single go test command, which is quite great. We only needed Docker runtime. So make sure that you have it when you, let's say, run your test in your CI. And also I wanted to show you how to run any custom container here. So not, not the one that's currently in the modules of test containers. Because imagine you maybe want to run some internal microservice or internal application. So what we need to do is to replace this Redis container creation with a little bit different approach. So test containers have this struct called container request, I believe. We can specify which image. Cool, we still can use this maybe Redis Alpine. We can then specify which ports to expose. So in Redis, it's usually, yeah, so TCP, and then wait for, and then I believe it's uh, wait for log. And yeah, let me just import that. So in case of Redis, that would be ready to accept connections. And I believe it's waiting for. Cool, so we have this request now. And now we have some configuration. We can do here is container equals generic container and then pass our request here. That's very similar as done here, though we specify which exact configuration do we want to run. So let's execute our tests again, right? As we can see in our logs, uh, there is this waiting for container step. And basically what happened that test containers saw this log message ready to accept connections, mark container as ready, and then executed our tests. So all worked well. Cool, and that's it for today. We learned how to use test containers to simplify provisioning and deprovisioning of your testing dependencies.